And we're going to now uh, move to the uh, next talk, which is also, I think, a 25-minute uh, talk. Yes, and uh, by Blake Richards, and uh, he's an assistant professor in the Montreal Neurological Institute, and also uh, a uh, on the faculty at McGill, which is actually at McGill University and the School of Computer Science at McGill. Uh, and uh, he uh, actually got his uh, undergraduate degree at Toronto, but has been in many other places around the world. Uh, in, in the meantime, at Oxford, has worked with uh, some old friends of mine, Wyeth Bear and Ola Paulson. Uh, he, as you'll see, has interest in neuroimaging and neuroinformatics, and I will let him carry his uh, talk forward on taking inspiration from the hippocampus in AI. Thanks very much, Terry. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Share. There we go. So I uh, assume you can all see my slides now. If not, someone please let me know quickly. Um, so indeed, today I'm going to talk about uh, how I think we can take inspiration from the hippocampus and AI. This is going to be like Tony's talk, a little bit high level. I'll show a, a, a little bit of data as well, though. Um, but I think that uh, this is a, an area where we can really draw a lot of inspiration from neuroscience in AI. And we've done a bit of it, but, but not as much as I think we can do yet. So um, for those of you who maybe saw the learning salon last week, uh, one of the things that I would argue is that, or I guess two weeks ago now, is that we can understand the current state of AI through the lens of memory. So let me explain what I mean that way. When we look at the different types of long-term memory that exist in the brain, there's a you know, whole hierarchy of divisions that, we can, that psychologists make. But broadly speaking, there are three distinct types of long-term memory that we see in the mammalian brain, which are uh, illustrated here. Procedural, that is how you do something, the act of riding a bike or drawing a particular uh, image or something like that. Semantic, um, so what do things actually mean? The facts on the ground, your knowledge about the world, your understanding of the relations that exist in the world. And episodic, so actual memories for things that we experienced, what we've seen, what we've heard, how we've felt, etc. I would argue that AI basically already does this well. We have procedural stuff kind of nailed. Now, we can all have um, discussions about you know, how much of it should be innate, how much of it should be learned, but I actually consider all that to be a little bit kind of besides the point to some extent. We basically already know how to wire up neural networks to do procedural stuff pretty well. Um, most people recognize that AI current AI systems don't do semantics super well, and we need a lot of improvement in that area. And there are many research groups who are working towards that. But I would also argue that episodic memories are an area that are ripe for innovation and where we could potentially gain a lot of traction. Now, um, today what I'm going to do is um, specifically focus on the question of the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is a key structure for episodic memory. And uh, you know, for those of you who know the anatomy of the uh, mammalian brain, it's of course a structure embedded deep within the medial temporal lobes. Um, and what I'm gonna argue in fact today is that even just with small tasks that we would think might be trivial for AI, we can see that they're not actually as trivial as we might imagine. And um, even if these things don't at first glance have to do with episodic memory, I'll, I'll argue that they they will eventually. And, and ultimately, what I kind of return to often when I look at some of the things that AI has problems with is that what current AI is missing is a hippocampus. And it needs, it needs a hippocampus, basically. Um, so let me give you some, some, some examples of what I'm talking about there. So what do you need a hippocampus for? Now, there's lots you need a hippocampus for. I'm not going to be able to go through it all. In fact, all I want to do at first right here is to give you a remarkably simple yet surprisingly complicated example, and that is trace conditioning. So for those of you who aren't neuroscientists or psychologists um, and aren't familiar with trace conditioning, let me just describe it very briefly. Trace conditioning is a very simple uh, experimental paradigm used in, in behavioral neuroscience. 
essentially what you do is you uh, present an animal with what's called a condition stimulus. This can be a tone, a light, whatever, some kind of sensory input that does not in and of itself have any value for the animal. And then after some period of time, you know, 30 seconds, whatever, you provide um, an unconditioned stimulus, i.e. something rewarding or punishing. So some food, maybe a little shock, whatever. And eventually um, the animals, an animal will learn to associate this conditioned stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. So for example, if you, um, you know, give them a little shock uh, 30 seconds after playing a particular tone from them, in the future, when you then uh, play that tone for them, they will freeze, indicating that they're aware of the kind of negative value associated with that stimulus. And um, you can do this in all sorts of modalities, etc. Now, the key thing for trace conditioning and what marks it as trace conditioning is this, this gap between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. You could, for example, have, um, as they called it in this paper from Gangas or at all, something. Uh, contiguous trace conditioning where you replay the conditioned stimulus um, in conjunction with the unconditioned stimulus. And uh, then we don't call it trace conditioning or delayed conditioning. Similarly, the, the unconditioned stimulus shows up right after the conditioned stimulus, et cetera. Now, what's interesting in part about trace conditioning and the reason I'm talking about it is that trace conditioning depends on the hippocampus. We know that if you lesion an animal's hippocampus, they cannot do trace conditioning across a wide uh, variety of uh, modalities. Even something as simple as like an eye puff to the eye and you get a nicotinic, uh, nicotine, ah, I never say it right, but a little membrane response to the puff of air, even that requires- Nicotating membrane. Nic thank you. Um, now, so, here you can see a plot from this paper showing that if you give this gap between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, an animal with sham lesions to the hippocampus is just fine, but with an actual lesion to the hippocampus, they can't do it. And it's specifically about this gap, because if you introduce this conditioned stimulus in here, then the animal's fine at it. Um, now this seems a pretty easy task. So why do you need a hippocampus for it? Um, so, one of the things I'm going to suggest is that it turns out that trace conditioning is kind of actually a weirdly difficult problem under some pretty basic restrictions about the nature of the task. If you step away even just partially from a toy version of the task, you immediately discover some weird computational difficulties with it, which perhaps the hippocampus solves for us. So the little bit of data I'm going to show you here is from a student in my lab, Anthony Chen. What he's been doing is simulating something that's kind of akin to a trace conditioning task. So the agent here illustrated as a little rat, but of course it's a computational agent, um, starts off in some state and then with 50-50 uh, probability will enter either a what we call a dog state or a cat state. There's then some delay and then they will at, at the end, the agent will at the end of the uh, delay receive either a positive reinforcement or a negative reinforcement. Um, so we call these the dog and the cat states here because we literally present images from the CIFAR data set of dogs or cats when the agent enters these states. So this is actually a visual agent. The architecture is shown here. We've got a series of convolution layers. Um, and then some uh, fully connected layers and, and then as well, uh, uh, general recurrent units uh, here. So it's a, it's a recurrent deep neural network. What it's got to do is it's got to learn based on the images it receives to estimate the value of the state that it's in. And um, we can make this either a fully observable or a partially observable task, depending upon whether or not the images that are presented to the agent are drawn stochastically from the distribution of dogs or cats, or if it's always the same image, in which case the agent knows for sure, just based upon the pixel data, I'm in state one or state two. Uh, so, so all the agent has to do here is learn the value of these states. So, so what we're going to look at in a second is its estimate of the value of this state, either the dog state or the cat state. And it should, if it does it well, learn uh, temporally discounted value for that state. Now, 
in order to explore the parameters under which this, this learning task gets uh, simple or hard, we're going to use something here called um, lambda return. So the idea behind, you're, you're surely many of you familiar with the idea of return in reinforcement learning. Return is your um, temporally discounted set of rewards and punishments into the future. And if you do proper Monte Carlo return calculations, what you do is you literally wait till you get all your rewards, and then you back up through time in order to calculate what that discounted return is at each of the time steps previously. Um, alternatively, though, if you can't wait around till you've received all your rewards, or if you don't have finite trials even, then you can't do Monte Carlo returns. And so instead, you have to cut off your return calculation at some point in time. And this is this can be done with lambda return. So basically, we have here this n step return. So these are the temporally discounted rewards n steps into the future. And then what we do is for the remaining future steps beyond the nth step, we just use the current estimate of value indicated here with uh, v hat, the current uh, estimate of value of the state. And so, of course, um, when we talk about uh, different reinforcement learning algorithms, um, TD0, te temporal difference learning zero, corresponds to a state, a situation where you only take the reward for one time step, and then everything into the future is estimated with this value function. It's, it's called bootstrapping your return. Um, now, but of course, there's, so Monte Carlo and TD0 represent two different extremes of how long you're, uh, you're, you're willing to kind of calculate the true return on. And in between, we have TD Lambda, which lets you go up to um, a certain number of steps into the future calculating return properly and uh, combine that in uh, a, a mathematically um, useful way with your estimates of return in the future. So this is what the lambda return looks like. And essentially, if this lambda parameter is, oh, sorry, something got cut off there. Uh, my apologies, so I'll just describe this verbally. If this lambda parameter is set to one, then you're going to be doing full Monte Carlo returns. You're waiting till you get all your rewards, and then you calculate your return. If your parameter lambda is set to zero, then you're just doing TD zero, and um, that's that's that. So now here's what gets weird. So I described to you this relatively simple task. It's just a trace conditioning task. All the agent has to do is estimate the value of the state that it's in. This is a deep recurrent neural network. Surely this is a piece of cake. Weirdly enough, um, TD Lambda doesn't handle this task very well in partially observable settings. So if you do not let the agent know exactly what state it's in, and instead it has to infer that from the sensory data somehow and learn a representation that captures that, um, then it doesn't actually perform super well as we shift Lambda towards zero. So here in these plots, what you can see are the, this is the error in the estimate of value that the agent is getting. And when we do Monte Carlo returns um, across different reward delay lengths, the agent is able to estimate the value, no problem. The, 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 the Monte Carlo returns, it's, it's fine, it's a piece of cake. But as we shift lambda towards zero and towards doing TD zero learning, uh, the agent gets worse and worse. And in fact, for long delays, we don't even get convergence with um, TD0 or, or even um, TD.5, which, which really surprised me. I didn't um, think that this would be a difficult task at all. And it should be said that it's the partial observability that seems to be a problem here, at least for TD Lambda. TD0 sometimes has some instabilities. But here, if we instead look at the fully observable case, where we just let the agent know you're in state one, or you're in state dog, or you're in state cat, and there's no inference that has to be made. Then, um, aside from some of the instabilities that TD zero indicate that TD zero possesses, the uh, what happens for all the other TD lambdas is they converge. So, in other words, it's it's critically the partial observability that seems to make this a difficult task for TD lambda, and I think that's really interesting um, because, you know, one of the things that's sort of um, uh, uh, not a dirty secret, but a reality about uh, for a lot of reinforcement learning out there in the literature is that people make sure that their tasks are actually effectively fully observable. 
So for example, if they do reinforcement learning with uh, video games, they'll take enough frames of the video game as the state that's fed into the agent in order to ensure that the task is actually fully observable, that the agent has all the information it needs in the images that it receives um, in order to know what state that it's in. And I, I think that, you know, as we move towards more sophisticated AI where we're not just playing video games and stuff like that, that sort of trick is probably not gonna be as viable. So as we start to move towards situations where we really have partial observability, we might need to take these sorts of considerations more seriously. Um, so this is just uh, this is just showing that that data again. So here in the fully observable setting, all of the algorithms can tend to uh, converge across a variety of delay lengths, but it gets worse and worse and worse for the TD lambda algorithms in the partially observable setting. Um, another interesting observation, though this doesn't seem to drive the the results here is that there actually seems to be a misalignment of gradients in these systems. So if you look at the gradient that you get from your value updates and the gradients that you get from the recurrent updates through your GRU, um, they actually are highly correlated in the Monte Carlo case, but not very well correlated as you shift lambda towards zero. And this is another interesting problem that exists for when you're doing bootstrapping of return. Um, so I need to move on, uh, but what I'm gonna, what, the reason I show you this data is I think that some of the things that the hippocampus might be doing for animals here, which is why they actually need one for something as seemingly simple as trace conditioning. Cause like you'd think trace conditioning could be done with very basic circuits is that the hippocampus might actually be helping to render the, the task closer to something that's fully observable by learning good latent state representations take in all the necessary information of the environment for the decisions that the animal has to make. Another thing is that the hippocampus might actually help to do something more like Monte Carlo by actually doing backwards projections of value calculations using things like replay and other stuff like that. And this is something that other people have proposed in the computational neuroscience literature, but which then might be important for AI systems. And we've seen that with, for example, the temporal value transport paper from uh, DeepMind uh, earlier this year. Um, and lastly, I think an interesting question is about potentially aligning value and representation gradients. And it might be a site that helps you to ensure that these gradients are in fact aligned. Okay, now lastly, I wanna just uh, move on to a kind of interesting question about pre-wired hippocampal circuits. So uh, Tony's talk um, was will be a good uh, intro for this. I. So, so I, I really appreciate Tony's perspective on this stuff and his, the discussions I've had with him have really changed my thinking in a number of ways, though I'm still a lot more bullish on learning than he is. And I think that uh, innate circuitry can only explain so much. But I think that the, in particular, the key question for AI is how you're gonna get innate circuitry to, to interact with learning. Um, and um, we've been exploring this a little bit in our lab with respect to this idea of the successor representation. So the successor representation is um, a, an idea originally developed by Peter Diane for reinforcement learning, but which has recently become of interest to many neuroscientists thanks to this paper from Kim Stackenfeld. Um, so basically uh, the successor representation is a representation that you can use to render your value calculations linear effectively. So if you look at the um, definition of value in reinforcement learning, which is your expectation of your future returns, that can be parsed down into a, uh, uh, what we call the successor representation and your reward function. And now the, the value is just a linear um, function on, on this uh, M. Now, so the successor representation is actually just your expected future occupancy of different states. Basically, that is how you represent the environment. In other words, if you have a set of nodes or, or entries in a table or even neurons that are representing the environment, a successor representation means a representation that is uh, capturing the expected future occupancy throughout all of uh, your um, excuse me, throughout all of your potential new states. And what, what Stackenfeld et al. showed, which I think is really interesting, 
is that you can actually explain things like hippocampal place cells with the successor representation. Um, like, so if you think of even just the shape of a place cell where if an animal's at a particular location, then the place cell that it has as its center of that location will be most active and nearby place cells will be partially active. One way you can think about that is that this is actually a representation of where the animal is most likely to be in the near future. Uh, and that really what this is, is a predictive map of the environment, which theoretically, if you then received rewards at different locations, you could use to very rapidly in a linear fashion, calculate an update to your estimate of value in those different states. Um, now, one component of that though, is that, you know, the original successor representation just said, okay, so you, you have this estimate of your future occupancy in all your different states, and that's that, um, that is your representation of the environment. But of course we know that the hippocampus is constantly kind of rapidly changing its representation of different environments. And there's this phenomenon called remapping. Sometimes people distinguish between rate remapping and global remapping. So here what you're looking at um, in, from this review by Colgan et al is, you know, a series of place cells as animals are put in different contexts. And what you can observe is that um, if you shift the um, uh, some of the sensory variables in a context, or you literally put an animal in a new context, you can see sometimes something called rate remapping, which is where place cells alter the rate at which they're firing at different locations, or global remapping, where the place cells locations literally change place. Um, and this can happen fairly quickly. It's not like you have to give an animal, you know, hours of experience in a new context in order to get remapping. So um, we've been thinking about this in my lab with respect to the successor representations by thinking about for AI, so this isn't even us trying to explain neuroscience, but this is us trying to take the intuitions that we gain from neuroscience to think about potential um, AI mechanisms. And we've been trying to think about, well, per Tony's point regarding the innateness that exists, could we learn uh, an initial innate kind of default successor representation for environments that we then just tune for different contexts rapidly and we have kind of different slots for different contexts um, in order to improve the agent's ability to just generalize between new contexts very quickly. So this was work done by Surya Penmetz uh, in my lab and here's the basic idea. So the agent is in this case in a, a sort of maze task it's got a maze of different wall structures and different little doors, and it's got to just navigate through this maze to find a reward. Um, in this particular case, the agent actually receives images, but it's a top-down image. So the agent see it's like a video game. It sees where it is in the environment and it can navigate through it um, and it sees the walls, etc. So we run these uh, image inputs through you know a deep neural network, but then what we um, what we have at the top is a series of different sort of memory banks of different successor features that can be learned. And what we do, in fact, is we pre-train these successor features in the different memory banks that we pre-train a default successor feature that gets used across the memory banks, which can then be rapidly tuned for specific uh, contexts. So what we do is we pre-train and freeze these weights throughout the deep neural network in a process that's kind of supposed to be akin to evolution. And then we've got these uh, default successor representations, which can now be tweaked for the different contexts. Um, and I'll just note there are two different architectures we use here. Either we've got just um, for each different successor feature that's, that's learned, that's tweaked in these contexts, a totally different set of weights to the Q values or alternatively, we can share those weights and uh, drastically reduce the parameters for the agent. So um, what we do then is we train, so, so we actually take, we call this the average successor feature because what we do is we, we train this up by training this part in our sort of evolutionary phase across many different of these maze, versions of these maze environments, just using a random exploration policy and, and we sort of take the, the average, as it were, of the successor features that get learned across these different environments. And what's this gonna mean? Well, 
what it's going to mean for the agent arguably is that it's going to capture the sort of expected occupancy that is consistent across all of the different contexts. Though, of course, it won't capture the specifics like the location of the door or something like that. And this is the kind of thing that's going to have to be learned by the tweaking of the successor features. So um, what we do, first of all, is we just look at, okay, if you, so even just ignoring the tweaking for a moment, if you just take your average successor feature and you compare how rapidly the agent can learn off of these compared to what a deep Q network can do, um, it can learn way faster. Interestingly, it actually learns faster with um, just with the shared parameters for the, for the successor outputs. Um, so that shows that in principle, even just the average successor features themselves are a good basis for doing some of the learning. But we know we can get better by also tweaking them with some additional learning. So this is where one we're minute, now- yeah, one, one minute warning for your- Great, thank you. I'll, I'll be wrapping up very soon. Great. Um, what we do now is we, we do some additional tuning in a specific environment. So there's been a pre-training akin to a sort of evolution to learn the average successor feature. And then within different environments, the different contextual representations can be tuned. Here you can see rate remapping uh, for the agent. Um, in this case, for example, what the rate remapping did is it took uh, you know, some of these initial um, features that had place cells located at locations that were actually walls and shifted them a bit and adjusted to, to make it better. You can also see some global remapping effects. Long story short, what we find is that um, if you, uh, if, you, if you do this, you can actually get really good RL much faster with just a little bit of unsupervised training in the new environment. And this is arguably kind of like animals. So, you know, that you, you basically just need to explore the environment a little bit, get a few time steps. In this case, like even with just 100 time steps, funnily enough, the, the, more, the higher parameter model works better here. But with you know, uh, a few hundred time steps in the new context and a bit of tuning based on that, you can actually get back up to, you can get up to the, the same level that you get with a DQN after many, 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 many millions of updates. So I think this sort of strategy of having a memory bank of a series of different contexts that you can rapidly remap inspired by the hippocampus is maybe gonna be a good strategy for AI in fact. So, um, that suggests that part of what the hippocampus might be providing is a pre-wired default predictive map with tunable contextualized maps. And, and that's something we might want to give our AI. So to end, uh, the path moving forward, I think, for endowing AI with hippocampus like powers is, is to think about all the different things the hippocampus can do. And specifically, I do think thinking about it in, with respect to episodic memory is important. I haven't focused on, on, that, on that in this talk, but I actually think that some of the key features of episodic memory have to do with some of the things I've talked about here. The nature, their, their one-shot learning nature, the fact that they're specific to particular contexts and contextualized, um, and the fact that they actually allow you to link up in a kind of autonoetic way the, the values that you've experienced in different contexts. Um, and I also think in the long run, we should be thinking about the circuitry, but I don't have time to talk about this. I had a few thoughts about this, but I'm going to cap off here. And that's another topic we can discuss later. So that's that. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, of course, to the other two organizers, Rhea and Tony, and to all of you. Um, I'll take some questions now. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Blake. This, uh, you know, the hippocampus is very dear to my heart. So, uh, it's good to see that you've taken it to your heart. <laughs> so uh, question for Blake and Franz Schur. There exists a body of work on RL on partially observable tasks that use memory augmented neural networks with attention, uh, such as Fort Fortunato 2019. Would you view such memory augmented networks as an instance of an artificial hippocampus? And could you comment on your thoughts about these approaches? Yeah, great question. Uh, short answer, yes. These memory augmented networks are in fact uh, networks with something that is the first stage of a sort of artificial hippocampus. I think that these uh, approaches will turn out to be critical. I think that what's missing from them right now is, well, a few aspects of episodic memory, the, but, but also scalability. 
you know, a lot of these approaches right now use differentiable neural dictionaries. And it's not clear to me that those are gonna be really scalable to true real world problems. The other um, issue is that I don't think they capture some of these finer aspects of episodic memory. They don't capture really the contextualized nature nor its interaction with the semantic knowledge in the world. So I think there's a lot more work to do in this direction, but I do think they are the first step in exactly that direction. Very good. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more work to be done here. Okay, so next question from Bian Quan. Uh, some have proposed a compressed sensing perspective for the hippocampus, uh, such as uh, a paper by Yoti Boyrazi. How does this reconcile with the RL perspective for the hippocampus that you described? Well, um, I mean, I think that this comes to the, the point I was making about that potentially part of what the hippocampus is doing is providing really good latent representations that render our tasks closer to something like partially observable, um, or at least closer to something linear for us. And you could see the idea that some people have put forward, um, you know, regarding the hippocampus providing compression. Uh, well, okay, so compressed sensing, I, I have to admit, I'm not familiar with a paper that specifically argues for compressed sensing, because my understanding is that compressed sensing uses random projections to do um, the compression. I don't personally think the hippocampus is using random projections. I think there's, it would be hard to argue that that's the case given the amount of plasticity we see in that system. But um, the basic idea that you might wanna compress the data in part in order to learn the, the appropriate representations is I think a not unreasonable idea and, and probably related to some of these predictive maps. One of the ways that you can learn a predictive map is in fact by um, trying to do compression on the, on the things. Prediction and compression are intimately linked. So, so I heard a, a talk to follow up. I, I heard a talk recently about the dente gyrus in the hippocampus, which has very sparse representations, very few neurons fire. But it turns out that it's essential for working memory tasks, where the, the rat has to remember what arms of the maze it went down. So, you know, I, I, th I think there's room in the hippocampus for a lot of different algorithms. Uh, okay, next. Uh, Question from Maximilian Tuzel. Uh, Blake, is there intuition why TD Lambda fails with partial observability? Is there any information gleaned from how failure varies over Lambda around the delay time, for example? Have you looked at TD Lambda variants that are more robust? Yes, this is a good question. Um, you know, this is exactly the kind of stuff that we're going to be doing over the next little while. I showed this data mostly because for me, it was surprising to see that for something as simple as trace conditioning, TD0 didn't work. I, I really would have thought that TD0 would work on, on a task like that with a recurrent neural network. And uh, I was surprised to see that it didn't. And, and for me, it helped illuminate like, you know, cause I always found it weird in the trace conditioning literature. Why the hell do you need a hippocampus to do trace conditioning? Like it's so simple. I play you a tone and two seconds later, I give you a shock. You got to learn that association. Why would you need a hippocampus? But maybe I think it has to do with these failures of TD Lambda. But to really understand that, um, indeed, we need to look over different variants. And I think ideally do a more robust mathematical analysis as well to, to try to figure out what's going wrong here and, and where things go awry. So, so unfortunately, my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's a very honest answer. I don't think anyone knows. Uh, but, uh, it, it, you know, you, you've put you, the most important thing is having a good question, right? Yeah. To, to study. Good. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Uh, this is from Sam Blakeman. How do you reconcile the SR with the hippocampus's role in episodic memory. Do you see them as distinct properties or, and, or functions of the hippocampus or can they be linked in some way? I believe place cells are thought to link spatial locations to sensory features. Right. Um, yeah, so I think that you can reconcile the SR with episodic memory, no problem. Um, you know, if we think about part of the, the um, 
core feature, one of the core features of episodic memory, which is that you have a sense of not just an instant in time, but literally like a, a sequence of events that have passed through. One good way to potentially link a sequence of events in your representations is to use something like an SR or some kind of predictive representation. And um, so in this way, I suspect those two features are intimately linked. Uh, and, you know, I think, uh, yeah, place cells probably do are key to linking spatial locations to particular sensory features. Um, arguably, one of the things that, you know, has come out in the literature is that the hippocampus is concerned with a lot more than space. It's actually making these very general representations of the state of the animal in the environment. And that's part of what we want in AI is this very general high level meta representation of the environment that's abstracted away from the sensory data, but which can still be linked back to the sensory data. Um, yeah. So th there's uh, this interesting experiment that's relevant to this discussion, which has to do with what happens when you turn the lights off? What right. happens to the place cells? Turns out that they do not go away. As the rat paddles around the environment, they're in the right place, and it's it, it's uh, it'll it'll continue for many minutes before the the rat gets confused. And of course, the same thing happens to you too in your room, right? When the wake up in the middle of the night and you're trying to figure out where the light switch is, right? You know roughly where it is, yes. even though you can't see it. And the fact is that that means the hippocampus has to hold on to this uh, environmental map for a long time without the sensory cue, right? And that's what you need, what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, we're going on to the last talk very briefly uh, from Yoshua Bengio. Blake, isn't the partially observable, observed case similar to the problem of learning long-term dependencies in RNNs? Yeah, I suspect they are probably linked, Yoshua. Um, I haven't done the exploration to say that for sure, but I share your intuition. Um, because to some extent, what's happening, I think, here is that basically when you're doing some form of bootstrapping in, in, your, in your RL, you're effectively creating a more long-term dependency problem for yourself. And so maybe mathematically, these things end up being basically the same problem. But, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, but that, that, that is my intuition. So I, I share your intuition that way. So another way we can think about the fundamental role of the hippocampus is in helping us to deal with long-term dependencies, whether it be via value or just broader questions of long-term dependency. Good, okay. Thanks very much, Blake, for a really interesting and I, th I think very positive uh, look of, of how a piece, a piece of the uh, brain uh, that has been neglected by AI may actually solve some basic problems, which uh, are, are, are still, uh, you know, not, not solved. Okay, uh, so we're going to go on now to the next speaker.